Okay. So again, the aerobic process, you would have to talk about glycolysis, the prep reaction, the Krebs cycle, and then that fourth step is oxidative phosphorylation. And that's the one that gives us the most ATP, phosphorylation. It's going to give us almost like 30 molecules of ATP, whereas glycolysis gave us four, PrEP gave us nine, and the Krebs cycle would give us one per Krebs but there's two Krebs cycles that happen. So technically two ATP. Okay. All right. So let's review a little bit and then we're going to look at some animations as we go. Okay. So first of all, let's just start with glycolysis. Glycolysis is considered. Well, no, I'll do that some other time. Glycolysis is going to start with glucose and you can see how it costs us two ATP to start. And we remove those phosphates and we put them here. We create this intermediate and then eventually it gets broken into two molecules here. And this is a big deal. These intermediates get oxidized, which means they will donate protons and electrons to this coenzyme, which is the NAD plus. So NAD plus, since it's getting those things is getting reduced to a molecule of NADH. Okay. After the NADH is made, we need to put this on our posters. I don't think I did a very good job of this. What is the purpose of those NADHs? Like, where are they going to go? Can any of you tell me where do you think those NADHs are going to go? Awesome. Specifically, to an electron transport chain. Because remember, these are like buses. They load up here, they carry precious cargo, and then they release that cargo. They release those protons and electrons. That's why I keep referring to them as buses. And the electron transport chain is like the school. We let you guys off at the school, okay? Now, does it make sense that after the NADH releases the protons and the electrons, it is regenerated into NAD plus? Does that make sense now we have the NAD plus to come back to get more protons and electrons for another glucose that's going through this process? Okay. All right. Because this is kind of key to something that we're going to talk about today. All right. Anyway, we end up with four ATP. And by the way, I'm going to go to indicate the cell keeps ATP and uses it. Sometimes students tell me the job of a cell is to make ATP and send it to other cells. And I'm like, nope. If a cell needs ATP, it has its own mitochondria and it makes its own ATP. That cell is like a city on its own. Cells don't make ATP and send ATP to other cells. Cells make proteins like hormones and they can send that to other cells. But ATP is kept by that cell and used for its reactions like to phosphorylate kinases, since we now know what that is. We have ATP, it can be turned into cyclic AMP. Okay, so now you have an idea of kind of what that ATP can be used for. All right, and when we're done, we end up with two molecules of pyruvate, All right? Well, let's take a look at what this kind of looks like. And I'm gonna start right here with glycolysis. Okay, I hit the wrong button. Let me hide those, get rid of you, okay? So let me just kind of know where you're at. This is the bloodstream. Here's some cells here, blood vessels, and out comes our glucose and our oxygens because they're delivered by the blood, right? Now, we're not gonna use the oxygens yet because we don't use them until the very last step, but we're gonna look at glycolysis and glycolysis is all about the breaking down of glucose, all right? So here we go. First question, I'm just going through my meat screens up here. So Abby, Abby Mir, can you tell me how many carbon atoms are in glucose? Awesome, that's the easiest question anyone's gonna get today. So that's how you could tell this was glucose, guys. Also, they like to put carbon atoms, they like to draw them black because carbon's black when you see carbon, so just FYI. So here's our glucose and we're gonna start to break it down. It cost two ATP to start that process. Addison Baumgartner, can you tell me what then 
would these yellow circles be? And I'm going to kind of shift. Awesome. So we took a phosphate from one ATP and a phosphate from another ATP and we put them there. Can you guys kind of tell where you're at on your posters now? We just broke that into two, three carbon molecules. Okay. And if you can't tell where you're at, it would be right here. Okay. Notice the phosphates. All right. Here we go. Keep going. All right. Here comes a bus. Aiden, can you tell me what this molecule is that's coming towards this three carbon molecule? Okay. And watch what happens. NAD plus picks up protons and electrons and they show the electrons as those yellow dots right there. So now we have NADH. At that same time, another phosphate group gets added. And that's why we have two phosphates now on these three carbon molecules. And that NADH would go to the mitochondria, to an electron transport chain. So away the bus goes. We're not going to see it anymore. Okay. All right. Now we have two phosphates. So this molecule, we can use those phosphates to make one ATP, two ATPs. Okay. Remember, though, that we had two of those molecules, so we can make ATP, 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 because we have four phosphates, all right? All right, next question. This molecule right here is about ready to go into the mitochondria. Elena, can you tell me what the name of this molecule is that's about ready to enter the mitochondria? Awesome. So in goes the pyruvate. Now, remember, the mitochondria has two membranes, and you should know why. It's evolution. So we're going to see the pyruvate go into first, the first membrane of the mitochondria, and then you see it go through the second membrane of the mitochondria, and now it's in the matrix. Did we label the matrix? Yeah, we did. I see that. Okay. So watch what happens to our pyruvate, and this is called the, the prep reactions. All right. So that molecule right there, Alexandria, can you tell me what this molecule is right there? And I'll give you a hint. We took a carbon atom off of pyruvate. So we remove a carbon atom. Let me show you right. Sure. It's right here. So when a carbon atom is removed, it's combined with two oxygens, and so you have carbon dioxide. There's our CO2. Okay, so there's our CO2. And here comes another bus, because remember we're gonna make, there we go, NADH again. Now, I like this because what we're about to make is acetyl coenzyme A. So this is the coenzyme part, a coenzyme. It's an organic molecule and it comes from vitamins. Like you will take certain vitamins and you turn them into coenzyme A molecules and coenzyme A then gets put on that two carbon molecule. And that's our acetyl coenzyme A. And it's going to enter the Krebs cycle. Now, I'm curious on worksheet 4.2. Did we do this back question number 19? Did we do this, guys? I thought we did. Okay. All right. And again, I just want to emphasize something. Here's acetyl coenzyme A. And this molecule right here, remember I talked about Cindy is kinky, so she fornicates often. <laughs> and that's just to help you remember the names of the intermediates of the Krebs cycle. Well, often is O. That molecule right there is called oxaloacetate. You don't have to memorize that, but you just need to understand what these diagrams are showing you. So if we start out with a six carbon molecule, you have to be able to explain how we got six carbons. If we take two carbons from the acetyl coenzyme A and we put it onto the oxaloacetate, then we would make a molecule that has six carbons. I hope that makes sense. It's pretty easy. It's just addition, two plus four. And by the way, that molecule I'm pointing at, that is citric acid. That's Cindy in our, our uh, acronym there. Cindy is. So that's citric acid. And by the way, that's why they call this the citric acid cycle. Because really the first molecule that gets made in the citric acid cycle or in the Krebs cycle is citric acid. Okay. So keeping that in mind, now you're going to be able to maybe understand kind of what's going on here. Bam. 
That's Cindy. That's citrate. See, it has a six carbons. Okay. So remember the numbers. Three, two, one, one. Do you see how we wrote that? Okay. So Alex, Alex Brooks, can you tell me what does the three go with? We're going to make three of what in this step? Awesome. So we got to load up three buses. So let's watch the first bus come in. Oh, you know what? I don't think the bus comes in yet. I think we actually make a CO2 first. There you go. So here goes the CO2, but here comes the bus. We just made one NADH. We already have one CO2. Now there's the other CO2. Here comes the next bus. We make a second NADH. Okay. Now, one thing I think this is kind of confusing. Notice from this molecule, we're going to get one ATP. It just shows the other one of these molecules coming in. Because remember, there's two acetylcholines I So we get one ATP from the Krebs cycle per turn. Here comes the different coenzyme. See the green? Notice it's a change in color. Bailey, can you tell me what this molecule is? This green one? Awesome. And it's going to load up protons and electrons from this intermediate. Good job. There we go. Now, FADH2. Elena Sanchez, can you tell me where the FADH2 is going to go to unload those? Did you hear me, Elena? The FADH2, do you know where it's going to go to ultimately get oxidized to, re to relieve it of the electrons and protons? Emma, can you help her out? Right, I know mine's maybe a little more color coded than yours, but here's our FADH2. It's gonna go unload at the electron transport chain. Does it make sense? Okay, that's where the buses get unloaded. Think of that being like unloading them at the school, okay? All right, and then we keep going here. One more, that's the third NADH. Okay, one thing to note, I'm just curious. Can anyone tell me what this four carbon molecule is? Anyone? I don't know, I mean, it's, you see it right there? That's it. And that's the O in often. Remember, Cindy is kinky. All right. So this one's the oxaloacetate. See how that got remade? That's why this is the cycle, guys, because the molecule that's needed to, um, to combine with acetylcoenzyme A gets remade in this process. So it can bind to another acetylcoenzyme A. So that's why it's called a cycle. All right. So now the Krebs cycle is over and we have all these buses. Oh, here comes just the next. It's just starting all over again is what it's showing you. Okay, here goes our buses. I love it that they're kind of bus colored. They're kind of yellow, orange. And they have arrived. Can anyone, actually, let me ask here. Um, and you know what? It's Hallie, right? Am I saying it right? It's not Haley. Is it Haley or Hallie? It's Hallie. It's Hallie. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure because um, I've heard it. students pronounce it different ways. Okay. So what is this purple blob? Can you tell me what this purple blob is? Yeah, that's a protein. And it's one of the electron transport chain proteins. Watch what's going to happen. You guys focus on the electrons. Okay, which are the yellow circles here. So watch what the electrons do, and I'm going to kind of point that out. So the electrons, here they go. So electrons are being donated to the electron transport chain. Okay. And it's those buses that are donating them. 
So we're saying in this case, we say that NADH and the FADH2, since they're unloading their protons and electrons, we say that they're getting oxidized. Okay. And you can see the electrons get passed down from protein to protein into to this last electron transport chain protein. Okay. They're going to zoom in here in just a second to show you some other important concepts. Here comes our, you can see. Now watch. As the electrons, which are the negatives, as they're getting past, do you see how some protons fly in here? They get attracted to that negative. And watch where those protons are going to go. Oh, that's, they're out here now. They get put into that inner membrane space. All right, now let's talk about where I'm kind of at on your posters, because this is something that is always going to be asked about several different times. Remember, the electrons get passed down the electron transport chain, but there's something that has to remove the final electrons. Otherwise, they all get backed up and this whole process stops. And this is the only place that oxygen gets used. Now, I don't know how crowded this is, but to kind of emphasize the O2 that's coming out is being used as the final electron acceptor. And this is the only reason why we have to breathe in oxygen is to make ATP. And it's to pull off those electrons. So ATP synthase, these protons can be concentrated and they can move through ATP synthase. All right, which let's look at that a little bit. All right. So we're kind of seeing here, remember oxygen, when I write oxygen, if you notice, I always write it as O2 because it's always two oxygens together. So there's the oxygen. It pulls off those electrons, hooks on to some H's. Here's an easy question. Spencer, can you tell me what these mole this molecule is right here? Can you see my cursor? I'm circling it. Okay, so what is that molecule? Okay, well, it looks like Mickey Mouse. What molecule have we drawn before? Yeah, it's water, okay? And then when you look at your, make sure you understand that the oxygen pulls off the electrons, combines with some hydrogens, and that's where water is made in this process. You need to be able to explain where water is made in respiration and why and how. Okay. All right. So we got the water. But they're going to show you really what the most important part is. And that's the fact that as the electrons are moved, this is being accomplished. These H pluses are being concentrated and they're gonna flow down the concentration gradient. And by the way, we can also say down the electrochemical gradient. And that just simply means that you got more chemicals out here than here. And since you have more positives, it's more positive in the inner membrane space than it is in the matrix. So we can say that the protons will flow down the electrochemical gradient through, not an ETC, watch our electrons here. They're flowing through this. That is ATP synthase. It is not a part of the electron transport chain. It never gets electrons. The electrons come here and then they get pulled up. So electrons never get passed here. But what happens is the pro flows. Protons can flow through ATP synthase, which causes it to be able to change its shape. And that shape change allows it to take ADP and a phosphate and put those together. Okay. All right. So let's answer some questions. And you guys are gonna have to help me out a little bit because I have everybody, I don't think we did all of this one though. So this is worksheet 4.2, worksheet 4.2. And I don't think we got all the way through question number three, did we? Um, Nathan, can you do me a favor? Can you hold up three to me so I can see how much of it we did? Just hold it up to your screen. Question number three on 
questions, right? Yeah. Or does anyone have it handy here? Nathan's was really bright, so I can see it. Thank you, Michaela. Michaela has hers all finished. Did we finish it? Did we even do G? Or is Michaela just an ultimate overachiever? <laughs> all right, guys. Did we answer E? Abby, did we answer E yet? Okay. All right. So did we, okay, let me make sure. We did A, right? So what is this showing us? Oxidative phosphorylation, right? And you can tell that because you can see we got water being made. Oxygen, that's the only place oxygen is ever used by your cell. We have all the H pluses being concentrated. And I believe I kind of drew where we're at in the mitochondria. Does that make sense? Did we draw that? Okay. So then did we label that this is the inner membrane space? Awesome. Okay. We label the matrix, right? How about E? Is ATP synthase in the diagram? It's not. And I don't remember if we did that. Remember, I would I was drawing ATP synthase. I drew it kind of like as a red protein. Okay. And ATP synthase is was not originally there. Because if it was, this is what you would have to be looking for. You would have to see a protein that protons can flow through. And you would also have to see that it was making ATP. Okay. So is ATP synthase shown in the diagram? The answer was no, because you're not seeing any proteins generating ATP. So it wasn't in there. Okay, F, did we identify the final electron acceptor? Awesome, which is your oxygen. Okay, G, did we finish G? I didn't think so. Okay, so guys, I, I'm using terminology to explain these processes, but you guys are going to have to be able to use terminology um, in a way that other people who are scientific, scientific literate would be able to understand, okay? All right, so let's take a look at G and see if you can answer or complete this question. As electrons are being moved down the electron transport chain, I want you to finish that sentence. Tell me what is happening as the electrons are moving down the electron transport chain. And you better be talking about H pluses. So as the electrons are moving down the electron transport chain, I'm gonna ask some of you to tell me what you wrote here in a second. Okay, uh, Micah, can you tell me what you wrote? Awesome. And the fact that you use the inner membrane space, that's key. Something else you guys could say or you have to know is that protons are being moved out of the matrix. So that's something that you could say. You can say protons are being concentrated in the inner membrane space. It's important that you know your locations, okay? All right. Um, did anyone talk about water getting formed? Some people do. They say as electrons get moved down the electron transport chain, they are accepted by oxygen and water is formed. You could say that as well. But really, this is the important part. 
is that the electrons and the movement of those electrons provide energy for the H pluses to become concentrated and move from a low concentration to a high concentration. So notice that's active transport, but we're not actually using ATP to move protons and concentrate them from low concentrations to high concentrations, but we're using the flow of electrons to provide the energy. Okay. All right. Let's talk about H. I put this on here because students will start to mess up their terminology. They start to tell me things like this. They will tell me that ADP gets reduced. It doesn't. If ADP gets reduced, then that means it gets protons and electrons. It doesn't. ADP gets a phosphate group, and that's called phosphorylation. ADP is getting phosphorylized. Okay. So we want to make sure you understand what we mean by oxidation and reduction. If a molecule is getting oxidized, then that means that it's losing its protons and its electrons. So NADH is getting oxidized. Okay. Let's see if you can figure this out. If NADH and FADH2 are getting oxidized, they're, what's getting reduced? What's getting the protons and the electrons? It's kind of a trick question. Would it make sense that the protein's getting reduced? If it's getting, remember rig, reduction is gaining, so it gains a proton and electron. Ultimately though, we can also say oxygen gets reduced because doesn't it get a proton and electron? To form water. So again, we can say oxygen is the final electron acceptor. We can also say that oxygen is reduced to water, which allows electrons to continue to flow down the electron transport chain. All right, but going back to H. So again, this process is called oxidative phosphorylation because at the ETC, which is the electron transport chain, blank is oxidized. And there's two things that are oxidized. NADH can lose its protons and electrons and FADH2 are being oxidized. So they're providing the electrons and the protons that can be used to phosphorylate ADP. And if I was gonna show phosphorylation, I could write it like this. Again, we're not adding protons and electrons to ADP. If we did, we would say it's getting reduced, but that's not what's happening. We're phosphorylating it. And students really can mess that up. We phosphorylate it. We're not reducing ADP. We're phosphorylating it. Okay. All right, time to draw. So you again can either take this poster and if it's blank on the other side, you can flip it over. If not, you need to grab a new piece of typing paper. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I'm going to also use some colored pencils, mostly yellow and red. And I'm going long ways. Like don't turn it sideways. I need you to be typical portrait, right? Think of your print. We're not going landscape. We're going portrait. Now we're going to talk about lecture three and some of the, the things about lecture three. I'm going to move this down in just a second, but I need you to divide your paper in half. Okay. So remember, if I said discuss the stages of aerobic respiration, you're discussing this poster. You would talk about what happens in those four steps. Okay. But if I asked you, to talk about what happens if cells aren't getting enough oxygen, then you would discuss anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration. So I'm going to name this poster anaerobic respiration. In anaerobic respiration, you would talk about two steps. You would talk about glycolysis and you would talk about glycolysis exactly the same way that you always talk about glycolysis. Because in the first step of anaerobic respiration, glycolysis still happens. Which brings me to a couple things. 
all organisms can do glycolysis, which indicates common ancestry. Glycolysis doesn't take an organelle. Remember, it just happens in the cytoplasm. So even bacteria do glycolysis. It looks just like our glycolysis. Okay. And if you think about it, did you think early Earth had oxygen on it in its atmosphere? So glycolysis can even happen when there is no O2. So glycolysis was probably the first type of reaction that developed that generated ATP for cells. Because glycolysis can happen and could have happened whenever the earth was developing 3.5 billion years ago when we had some simple cells, but there was no oxygen yet in the atmosphere. Okay, second step. This is the new one. We're going to first talk about lactic acid fermentation is the second step. Lactic acid fermentation. Okay. All right. Here we go. Let's go ahead and I'm going to put a bloodstream over there like we usually do. And I'm going to indicate no O2 is coming out of the bloodstream because you are out of shape. Your heart isn't strong because you haven't been exercising. Your circulatory system can't provide adequate blood flow. Your lungs are out of shape, so your diaphragm doesn't contract as forcefully as what it needs to to bring in and exhale, you know, gases, okay? So you're not getting O2. So let's draw a big cell again. And this is just in the upper part of your paper. And I'm just going to indicate animal cell because you are an animal. And if you're not able to get oxygen delivered to your cells, you can't do this. You have to do plan B. So I like to kind of call this plan B. Technically, there's no, it's not called scientifically plan B, but I think you guys understand what plan B is. If plan A doesn't work out, man, you got to switch over to plan B. Okay. All right. I want you to go ahead and draw a mitochondria in there. Pretty big one, but I don't want it to take up the majority. I need to see more cytoplasm. Because these two steps happen in the cytoplasm. I'm going to indicate that. They happen in the cytoplasm. So again, these can happen in bacteria because they have cytoplasm. And bacteria can use these steps to generate ATP. So they don't need the mitochondria. Okay. All right. Do you remember that we needed O2 here? This is the only place where we need oxygen. Okay. And remember, there is no O2. I don't like how I wrote that. So our electrons bounce So my electrons are here, but there's no O2 to pull them off. So everything backs up. This electron can't move, this electron can't move, this electron can't move, this electron can't move, and the buses cannot unload. So that's what I'm trying to show you here by putting a bunch of NADHs and a bunch of FADH2s. No oxidation can occur. Okay, so they can't unload their protons and electrons because there's no place to put them because this is all like like a traffic jam, traffic backing up. Okay. So basically, when there's no oxygen, oxidative phosphorylation cannot occur. So I'm going to kind of show you oxidative phosphorylation. That's an aerobic process. You have to have oxygen. So we call that an aerobic step. Okay. So that's not going to happen. The Krebs cycle ultimately doesn't happen either because it needs NAD pluses and FAD pluses, and they're all tied up. They're all waiting to unload. So the Krebs cycle shuts down. And even the prep reaction shuts down. Okay. 
And again, really, you're going to see why here, why the Krebs and the prep reaction are going to shut down. All right. So first step, cells going to keep doing glycolysis. It always does glycolysis 24 seven. You never shut down glycolysis. Doesn't take oxygen. And I like to kind of emphasize my stages with a color. Okay. Glycolysis always looks the same. Your blood, or remember, and your cells also have some stored glucose in them. So they can release it to your system so you can at least get some glucose. All this should kind of make sense here. This is the highlight of what I need you to understand. It kind of happens right here. Does this make sense? Have we seen that happen before? Okay, right? Remember it also happened here? Okay. Does it make sense if the cell doesn't have NAD plus, this step doesn't happen? It would stop right here. We would get glycolysis. We would, you know, use 2 ATP to start the breakdown of it. But if the NAD plus isn't there, then these intermediates just stay there. Okay. Okay. But as long as there's NAD plus, this next step can happen. And so can the other like eight steps so that we can get a total of four ATP. I'm not going to draw it completely out. You guys already drew it out once. But hopefully this is this short abbreviation of glycolysis makes sense to you. I am going to color code it a little bit. I'm going to make my ATPs be red again, just to help emphasize that glycolysis at least gives you four ATP. Okay. Glycolysis makes some buses. Okay. So we load up some protons and electrons from glucose and then we get the pyruvate. So nothing is different. That's glycolysis, right? All right. I think I asked, I think I asked Alex this question. So I'm going to go back to you again, Alex. So these NAD pluses that are made in glycolysis, where do they go under normal circumstances? Where do they go? Right? Okay. But that's not going to happen, right? Because look, there's all these NADHs and FADH2s. Nobody can unload, including this bus. We have a problem. And if they can't unload, we can't get an empty NAD plus to come back. So this step happens. So ultimately, glycolysis would shut down if we're out of NAD plus. It would shut down right there. And we won't get any ATP. Okay? So we need a way to get more NAD pluses. So this is what we do. See our pyruvates? Well, we can't use them because the prep reaction shut down. So, hey, let's do plan B. So the second step is the lactic acid fermentation step or the fermentation step. So lactic acid fermentation can occur. And it's really simple. Pyruvate gets turned into lactic acid. I'm just going to label that lactic acid. Okay. But that's not the important part. This is the important part. The bus. We got to get some NAD pluses. We have to unload a bus to get free NAD plus. And we have lots of pyruvates, so let's use them. So what happens in the fermentation step is the NADH can get oxidized here, not at the electron transport chain, which means it donates protons and electrons 
And does that make sense once it gives up protons and electrons? We now have ourselves some NAD+. for this early step in glycolysis. You see it? So the purpose of this lactic acid fermentation, it's not to make lactic acid, it's really it regenerates. This is what you have to be able to tell me. Regenerates NAD+. So glycolysis can continue. And how many ATP do we get in glycolysis? four, right? So at least you're getting four without oxygen. It could be none, right? It's like when I can, my kid, you no, know, he wants something. And I give him four of them. He's like, ah, that's all four of it is. I was like, it could be none. So you better be happy with your four, right? Okay. So this is the important part that you need to understand. What's the purpose of the lactic acid fermentation step? It provides a regeneration of the NAD plus. And by the way, if the NADH is being oxidized and it's giving its protons and electrons to the pyruvate, we can say the pyruvates get reduced. They get reduced and now they're lactic acid. Also, let's see if this makes sense. Do you see how lactic acid looks very, very close to pyruvate? Well, as soon as you start getting oxygen, like your coach stops running you to death, <laughs> you have all this lactic acid, you can still use it for energy. So it can actually be converted back into pyruvate and then it can just go right into the, Krebs, the prep reaction, the Krebs cycle. So you can still use it for energy. Just later on, once you finally have some oxygen because practice is over, right? And now you're sore. You're sore because you're out of shape. You made all this lactic acid. Eventually, your cells will break it down and use it to generate ATP, but it's going to take you about three days to clear your cells out of that lactic acid. So you're going to be sore for about basically three days, okay? All right. You guys want to see what I'm making for Christmas? I'm bringing the wine. So let's talk about do-it-yourself winemaking here. They're never going to ask me to bring anything ever again. When I show up with some hooch, and they'll look disgusting. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about yeast cells. They have a plan B too, but it's not lactic acid fermentation. Okay. So again, Yeast, they have a plan B, okay? They can do anaerobic respiration. They do glycolysis just like the rest of us. But instead of doing lactic acid fermentation with the pyruvate, they do alcohol fermentation. They do alcohol fermentation, which brings me, you know what? I didn't color code this very well. I like to put like things together. So first step, second step. Okay, so that's the anaerobic process in cells when cells are out of oxygen. Okay, so here is a yeast cell. I guess it's not plural. Okay, so when yeast cells are deprived of oxygen, then they have a plan B. They can make ATP and they have to use, make, make, use ATP. So the same thing happens is they can take in glucose. And again, the first step is glycolysis. Okay. 
and it looks exactly the same as glycolysis and all other organisms on this planet, whether they have oxygen or they don't have oxygen. Glycolysis produces NADH. I'm going to draw mitochondria. Very simple mitochondria. Okay. Oxidative phosphorylation can't happen. Neither can the Krebs. Those are aerobic processes, which means you must have oxygen or they are all going to shut down and the prep reaction. Glycolysis is considered an anaerobic process because without oxygen, it can keep going. But it will get shut down if you're out of NAD, okay? So again, the NADH, it can't go to the electron transport chain. So think of it, it's like a detour. Detour, okay? So let me keep going here with glycolysis. I'm just, again, simply showing that glycolysis it makes four molecules of ATP which is through what's called substrate level phosphorylation. I'm going to grab my colored pencils here. I'm going to kind of highlight my ATP, which is always made in glycolysis. I'm going to grab my green here for my pyruvates. You always get two molecules of pyruvate. Okay. And remember in glycolysis, we make the NADH, we make two of them. I'm not going to put them both on there, but I think you get it. Okay. All right. The cell is out of NAD plus. It's there, but it's all tied up already. So we have to unload those protons and electrons somewhere. Exact same thing. We have lots of pyruvate, might as well use it, right? So this step is alcohol fermentation. is the alcohol fermentation step. Okay. Now, one thing that's kind of different here, notice what the alcohol looks like. And it's called ethyl alcohol, but you don't have to know that. See my alcohol? What's missing? What got removed? Awesome. And any time a carbon gets removed, it combines with two oxygens So notice that when I was doing lactic acid fermentation, we don't generate any CO2 when we do lactic acid fermentation. But yeast do make CO2. See all my bubbles in there? Okay, so here's what I put in this bag. Glucose, it was in the blueberries. I crush blueberries or you can crush strawberries or for wine, you, you crush grapes usually, right? That's my glucose source. The yeast cells, I put them in there. Yeast, like you used to make bread with. I put yeast in there. And notice what I did with the bag. I push out and I have very limited air in there. So pretty soon when they run out of oxygen, they will switch over and they will start making alcohol, okay? But again, the yeast aren't all for making the alcohol. The alcohol is actually toxic to them and will kill the yeast over time. So they're not trying to make alcohol to survive. They're trying to make ATP. And remember, you can't if we don't have any buses. So again, this step is all about regenerating NAD plus for glycolysis because glycolysis can at least give us four ATP. Regenerating NAD plus for glycolysis. So the NADH can be oxidized. I'm putting oxy there, oxidized. Pyruvate is getting reduced. And that just simply means that it's taking those protons and those electrons off the NADH that regenerates the NAD plus. And if I can say the most important thing that you have to know 
It is this about what is the purpose of the fermentation step to make NAD plus or regenerate the NAD plus so glycolysis can give a cell at least four ATP. Ta-da. Okay. Um, so three minutes, it's almost Christmas break. Okay. I got my wine ready to go. By the way, I, I learned how to make this from a friend of mine that used to work in a prison because she came home one day and she said, Miss Spencer, there was like four inmates we had to take to the hospital with alcohol poisoning. I was like, giving them alcohol in prison? I was like, where did the alcohol come from for them to get so drunk on? She goes, they made it. And this is how you make it. She said they would smuggle fruit scraps from the kitchen. So like when they ate an apple, you know, you have the rind left over. Well, that has glucose in it. So they would take a bag and they would stuff um, orange scraps. They would stuff little pieces of fruit. They would put their apple cores in there. And then someone else would smuggle out bread dough. And bread dough has the yeast in it that's still alive. So they would put the bread dough in there. They would fill it up with water in a bag and they would take out the oxygen and they let it sit there. You know where they hide it? Does anyone know where they hide the bag? They put it in the toilet. They stuff it in the toilet and they just leave it in there for like weeks. And the, the yeast, as long as you keep filling up and adding glucose, then they can keep making more and more and more alcohol. So as long as you keep them alive, they'll keep making alcohol and they can't ever tell how strong it is. So when they go to drink this stuff, like they can get rip roaring drunk um, because they don't know how much oxygen or alcohol they're actually consuming, what the concentration is in there. It depends on how warm the yeast are and how much glucose you gave them. So anyway, um, I'm really not taking this to Christmas. I, want, I don't want you to think I sit around making alcohol all day. I don't. But anyway, I just want to demo it to you. We usually make it when we're in class, um, but, and then we can smell it and you can smell the alcohol like after a couple of days and you can see all the bubbles, the CO2. Um, but anyway, okay. Does someone have a question? I heard someone and I interrupted you. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things that we tell you guys so that you don't partake, right? We also tell you that sitting too close to the TV can make you go blind. And that's not true either. It's just you sit in front of the TV and we can't see the TV. So we tell you something so that you'll move back so we can watch our flipping TV, right? All right. One minute. You guys have a Merry Christmas. I got to go check to make sure my son isn't making coffee again. I hope you guys have a great holiday. Make sure you watch those three lectures and get your notes taken because um, we're going to come back to pretty much like a test, maybe um, like two days or three days after we return. Okay. All right. Have a great Christmas, guys.